Test one, two, testing the mic. My name is Art Perry, and right now I'm in my hometown of Vancouver, out in the Havana restaurant, because what I'm all about is art as life, and so we're here out in the real world. You know, it's very easy for me to talk about the Tibetan people and to photograph them. It's actually a privilege uh, to be part and share their lives. I think what's important and also shocking about these images is that they are quickly becoming part of lost history. And within this decade, they've gone from living documentary images to something else, almost cultural artifacts. As beautiful as the photos may be, there's always that intervention behind the scene of what I've photographed. For instance, this young man who collects salt. There's a new importation of sea salt into Tibet. What this means is that it's cheaper than the salt that he collects from the brackish lakes on the Chantang Plateau. Now the Tibetans, tens of thousands of them, have been taken from their, their land, taken from their herds, and put into what are called uh, new villages. What this means is that they no longer are relating to the land. They're, they're in cinder block buildings. I want to know that as a planet, as a bit of cosmic dust that seems so bent on self-annihilation, that the least we can do is to defend and preserve Tibet as a culture. I don't think this is too much to ask. Shangri-La is a modern and very charged myth. The idea of an earthly Eden, uh, a paradise where time is not burdened by progress or practicalities. The myth itself, of course, began in 1933 with the book Lost Horizon by James Hilton. And uh, what Hilton did was he took the mystery, the mysticism uh, of Tibet and gave it an exotic name, Shangri-La. It just rolls off the tongue. And it's a perfect uh, idea. The idea is it's a secret Himalayan place without worldly suffering and death. The Western world immediately embraced the idea of Shangri-La, this utopian purity and perfection. Uh, remember that Hilton's book was published during the Great Depression, and uh, that was a time of dreaming, to be sure. Are we in the West filling the emptiness of Tibet with our own expectations and needs for spiritual salvation and even eternal happiness? I, too, believe these cliches. I believe that what I'd read and what I'd seen, that there were monks in these beautiful beet-colored robes, uh, wandering around monasteries in complete peace and harmony. I realized that a lot of the assumptions that, were, uh, that I myself and many people put on to the Tibetans come from a kind of uh, exotic romanticism. People themselves don't live in a sheltered enclave. They live in a country that's a part of our world now. Since 1951, Tibet has been occupied by China. The harsh fact of this is that since 1951, one million and two hundred thousand Tibetans have been killed. That's one in six. Shambhala is Tibet's utopia. It's the, the perfect Tibetan kingdom that's the source, as I said, of uh, Shangri-La. If you fly over the Arctic, you're not going to see Shambhala. But I think one of the beautiful, most beautiful uh, visualizations is that Tibetan nomads say that they can see the roofs of Shambhala in the north reflected in the northern lights. In visualization, the Dalai Lama himself said that uh, Shambhala does not exist. Uh, you can't find it on a map, but it does exist, if not on the planet, at least in the reality of um, uh, the Buddhist mind. We visualize Tibet 
from all the fractured imagery we have uh, as being magical and somehow unspoiled and perfect like we'd like our own world to be. Here's one of my photographs that, that many of the Westerners see as the epitome of what they view Tibet as, uh, the, their own visualization from the cliches, from the stereotypes. And it's of a monk standing at uh, Gandon Monastery. Now for myself, the first time I went to Gandon, it was like Shangri-La. I approached the monastery, which is on a very high hill, by going up a switchback road. And the sky became blacker and blacker. And as I reached the top, all of a sudden this ray of light came down. It came straight from up above and it hit the, the golden roofs of uh, Gandon Monastery and it glimmered against this charcoal sky. Then a few months later, uh, after I'd visited Gandon, the Chinese uh, forces arrived at Gandon and opened fire on the unarmed monks of the monastery. One of the main hurdles that I find for myself as a documentary photographer is not reinforcing the pictorial uh, stereotypes of the Tibetans. What I try to do is to not set up photographs, not to carry some kind of uh, a stereotype or ideal in my back pocket and uh, allow the situation and the people to present themselves as naturally and honestly as they possibly can. Uh, I remember one day being out on the, the desert, the high altitude desert, and forgetting to put uh, some sort of protective lotion on the back of my hands. And the next day I woke up and the skin was just flaking off, black charred solar scorched skin was just flaking off my hands. It's that harsh. It is relentless, the outdoor light in Tibet. Here's an image of a nomad. Uh, he's a man who, uh, like many of the nomads, have had their eyes ruined by the unsheltered high altitude atmosphere. and. Uh, Eyes of the nomads by the age of 50 literally dry up. The nomads do everything they can. They cover their lips and their cheeks with uh, yak butter to give it some protection. But what this man has done is he's fashioned a pair of protective uh, goggles as he tries to exist in this uh, landscape that the Tibetans uh, call uh, the place of no man and no dog. If you look at another image, this is an image of a, um, a young nomadic boy with his goats. Now, uh, you see his eyes are puffy. By middle age, he will uh, be virtually blind by uh, cataracts. In the sparseness of the Tibetan landscape, everything does become clear, like the light and air itself. There's something about being in this kind of atmosphere that that makes the mind very, very um, fertile. And I think that's one of the reasons for the uh, profound clarity of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Um, here's an image. This is an image of a, an old monk at Sarah Monastery. And he's in a, a temple. And Buddhist temples, like the Gothic cathedrals, are unearthly. The thin mountain air, that harsh air, is replaced by the thick, buttery uh, smell and light of the yak butter candles. And it's a, it's a waxen world. Uh, how can I describe it? You have the, the glinting brass. You have the juniper incense. Uh, um, if you try to steady yourself, because it's very dark and the, the paving underfoot is often worn smooth and round by the pilgrims who have come for many centuries. What happens is you reach for the wall and you, your hand is cushioned. You're actually pushing into the soft butter soot. And in the butter soot, coins have been pressed by the pilgrims as they come through the, uh, the, the temples and make their pilgrimage. And in the darkness, the candlelight, it catches these coins that are embedded 
and they're like falling stars. Traditionally, Tibetans have been either nomadic or monastic. And uh, for most Westerners, the focus has been on the monastic. Uh, it's the sequestered, devout, spiritually advanced Tibetans uh, who are seen as the monks. And the Shangri-La myth is more about wisdom and sacred isolation. It's important that we realize there are two parts, the nomadic and the monastic. Now this is one of my personal favorite uh, portraits of the Tibetans. It's of a man called Karma, and he's in his 60s, and he's in a tent in a place called Gertsi in the, in the north of Tibet. And uh, like many of the, the nomads, uh, he's virtually blind from cataracts because of years in the, the harsh sunlight. And he's come to this encampment from over 2,000 kilometers away because there's an international doctor who's going to cure his cataracts by putting in new lenses. And in a tent nearby is his wife, his wife, Choke Doma, who uh, he hasn't seen in over a decade. And she's getting her hair ready and uh, for the next day when they see each other. The next day when the doctor removed the bandages, he opened his eyes and he saw Choke and they smiled at each other. They clasped each other's hands and they walked out onto the Chantang Plateau and went over to see a black crow that was on the horizon. And it was perhaps one of the most beautiful and tender moments I've, I've seen anywhere. And it was a moment, like so many I hope come through in my photographs, of human reality and not a stereotype. These are two people who share love and it's expressed in the photo. In fact, it's the last photo I put in the book, in my book on Tibet, uh, along with a prayer by the Dalai Lama. At the very least, I hope these Tibetan images do capture what's valuable for us all. Dignity, a sense of joy, love, the human spirit, so enjoy the photograph, and these are amazing people. But, but please, please remember, Tibet is not Shangri-La, it's real. There is a reality there, and that reality is sacred and beautiful, as it may appear, is sadly and rapidly becoming a myth, a myth just like Shangri-La.